Hello everyone, welcome to the Common Sense Academy. Today we're gonna take a look at a video of a sovereign citizen who identifies himself as a sovereign citizen in court. He tangles a little bit, argues with the judge, brings up a couple of different topics such as jurisdiction, the right to a jury trial, and mens rea. The judge isn't having any, any of it, okay? Has him put in cuffs and gets him hauled off. Today we're going to watch the video and then I'm going to analyze those three legal concepts that I just mentioned. I'm going to talk about them and give you a description and a visual of what the law is. Let me know what you think about this new format in the comments if you watch. The video is going to be a little bit longer but perhaps more informative and more fun. Okay. Uh, before we dig into this video, many of you came here for other reasons. You came here just to do a same time sip with me gives us a little uh, a little boost before we watch the video peps up our morning or our day or perhaps even our evening so raise your cup your glass in the air cheers with me it tastes better when we sip together delicious. Also, do me a favor, subscribe to this channel if you're not subscribed. It's a free, easy way to uh, support the show. When I get to 10,000, YouTube is going to give me new features to use. Trying to get to 10,000. Thank you. Let's move on. With all due respect, I'm a sovereign citizen, right? I don't know what that well, means. I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, there's no one that has control over me. I'm a free person right well, now. you may be a free no, person. No, I'm, I'm a free person right now. And you're not around. free anymore. With all due respect, I'm a sovereign citizen, right? I don't know what well, that means. I'm telling you, there's no one that has control over me. I'm a free person right well, now. Well, you may be a free person. No, I'm a free person right now. I'm a free person right now. And you're not free anymore. You interested in it, sir? No, I'm not. What do you want to do? I can't challenge the jurisdiction in the first place. What are you talking about? Challenge the jurisdiction, the right to sit in the first place. I'm I moving my constitutional rights in my country this morning. What was that? The Constitution. Is this a court of law? You know, it is a court of law, yes. Well, I'm here under the law, the Constitution. You want to do that, correct? Yeah, Mr. McFadden. That's okay. okay. Yes. So, would you like a trial here today, sir? I'm um, plead guilty. This, um, I came to see him. I can't plead if you don't have jurisdiction. Though. With all due respect, I find as a matter of fact that the state of Maryland, the right. county of Baltimore, has jurisdiction over you. Um, Sorry, I made my mind. We're not going to argue. I, I'm requesting a jury trial. Uh, well, you have a right to choose your judge. You have no right office. to a jury trial. I, well, well, you always have a right to a jury trial. I need to see that law, sir. Sir, I need, with all due respect, I need to see the law. Because we're in the court of law. Sure. Look, let me explain something to you. I don't show lawyers any law, they show me law. I'm not showing you any law, you show me law. With all due respect, I'm a sovereign citizen, right? I don't know what that well, means. I'm, I'm, what I, there's no one that has control of me. I'm a free person right well, now. you may be a free person. No, I'm, no, I'm, I'm a free person right now. For what you're not free anymore. Then it has to be a crime. It has to be intent, right? That's what I'm saying. Okay, I mean, there are some crimes, sir, that have mens rea attached to them. Mens rea is intent. But then... Misery is, is, is what? Is can you explain the men's rate to me, please? Because I, I'm an idiot. I don't know what the men's rate is. Can you explain it? You're a smart man. You can explain men's rate to me, please. Okay, if these were cases that involved an intent crime, right? Like you would attempt or be having an intent to injure me. Exactly. But we don't have that here. Exactly. These are non intent crimes. So they're civil cases. Right? And these are criminal cases. So where's the intent? Where's, where's the victim? That I'm mean, not every criminal case needs an intent, sir. So then it's, what's, what am I being charged with? Why am I, well, I think you've been told a thousand times. So then I need jurisdiction. Very to obey charge. a lawful order. Why was it a lawful order is what I'm saying? You want to try the case? You don't want to try the case. It's up to you. I, I want, want a jury it. trial. I do want to try a jury. Sure. You're not entitled to a jury. I am. I'm a free man. I'm entitled to a jury trial. You free all day long, but it's not listen oath. to me. Hey, Honor, you You're not listening now. Are you by the oath, John? Am I? Are you under your oath to the Constitution today? Oh, absolutely. So you're under your oath. So we're a court Let of law. Let me explain this to you, yes, sir. Right. Unless it takes, unless there's 90 days. Unless it carries with it 90 days, you have right to a jury trial. Listen, I wrote a motion. Listen, 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 you listen to me. I'm a, why, why am I listening? I'm a free man. That's what you do. You, you don't have authority over me as a free with man. With all due respect, I will give you a step back, John. All right, take him into custody. In the custody, custody my court. For what cost? Oh, I'm a free man. No, 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 no. Oh, oh, oh. Look at this. 
What's the charge? You're disrupting my court, sir. What's, what's the I charge? offered you to take a plea you didn't want to do. I offered you a trial you didn't want to do. You haven't committed a crime. Oh, no. I haven't committed a crime. Another day in court for a sovereign citizen equals another day in jail for a sovereign citizen. The interesting part about this guy is he actually called himself a sovereign citizen directly to the judge. He said he's a free man. The judge came back and said, you may be a free person until I lock you up. However, it was still surprising to me because most sovereign citizens don't openly identify themselves as sovereign citizens using that language because they know that they will immediately be looked at as a loon. Now, this guy, I think he needs to go back to sovereign citizen school, okay? He got a couple of the lines out, but a lot of them, uh, he was just really off his mark, okay? Uh, we go back to uh, some of the prior videos and some of the guys uh, we've seen before and they can boom, 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 boom. They can hit all the sovereign citizen marks. This gentleman um, really, really needs some work. He needs to go back to sovereign citizen school. Uh, I enjoyed a couple of the transactions here. Uh, he challenged the jurisdiction and the judge said, I find as a matter of fact that I have jurisdiction over you. And he just had no comeback to that. He kept asking for a jury trial and and just vaguely referencing constitutional rights uh you know he doesn't have the right to a jury trial in this case this is likely a petty or non-serious offense all right and the judge kept telling him that this is one sovereign citizens usually cannot swallow they want that jury trial even if it's on a traffic ticket um he then tells the judge to ask him to show him the law. And the judge says, I don't show you the law. You show me the law. That's true. That's true for lawyers as well. If lawyers don't bring up the law, the judge is just going to apply whatever law he wants to apply. He doesn't have to tell you what it is that he's doing. Some of them will, just as a matter of fact and a courtesy and just to get their point across. Um, he didn't understand what mens rea was. We're going to talk about that in a second. Um, and, uh, you know, overall, I thought this guy, he just needs way more sovereign citizen training. Okay. He still ended up in jail, um, but he just was not crisp and clean on his points. Like some of the sovereigns that we see are boom, boom, boom. You know, his buddies there is videotaping this and sort of swearing under his breath. Perhaps you should have trained your friend a little bit more. At least he would have come off a little bit better. There's nothing, there's nothing worse than a sovereign citizen, but a, but an unprepared sovereign citizen, you're really killing me, man. You're really killing me. So this is my new format. What I'm going to do now is we're going to talk about three of the legal topics that came up in this. Uh, the one thing he, and this is something all sovereign citizens do, it was jury, he challenged jurisdiction. He asked for a right to a jury trial, something that's uh, not all sovereign citizens do, but most of them do. And he talked about mens rea. That's not usually in the sovereign citizen playbook, but I'm going to talk about it anyway because it's an opportunity. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to take a look at some of the law in regards to jurisdiction. So jurisdiction is often brought up by sovereign citizens, but they really don't know what they're talking about. This is the actual law on jurisdiction in the majority of the states. So in order for a court to have jurisdiction over someone, they must have subject matter and personal slash territorial jurisdiction. Subject matter jurisdiction, we're going to take a look at first. It is the authority of a court to hear cases of a particular type or cases relating to a specific subject matter. For instance, bankruptcy court only has the authority to hear bankruptcy cases. Subject matter jurisdiction is distinguished from personal jurisdiction, which is the power of a court to render a judgment against a particular defendant and territorial jurisdiction, which is the power of a court to render a judgment concerning events that have occurred within a well-defined territory. Unlike personal or territorial jurisdiction, lack of subject matter jurisdiction can be waived. 
a judgment from a court that did not have subject matter jurisdiction is forever nullified. To decide a case, like we said before, a court must have a combination of subject matter and either personal or territorial jurisdiction. Uh, personal and territorial jurisdiction are sort of one of the, in the same. We're going to talk about it in a second. But here's an example of some subject matter jurisdiction. Many state court systems are divided into divisions, such as criminal, civil, family, and probate. A court within any one of those divisions would lack subject matter jurisdiction to hear a case regarding matters assigned to another jurisdiction. Most U.S. state court systems include a superior court that has general jurisdiction. It is competent to hear any case over which no state court has exclusive jurisdiction. And then the federal courts have exclusive jurisdiction over a small percentage of cases, such as copyright, patents, bankruptcy courts, okay? And state courts have the authority to hear the vast majority of cases. That is all correct. Uh, so a criminal court is not going to be able to hear a civil court, uh, a, a civil court case. A family court in, in the state in the state system is not going to be able to hear a bankruptcy court case that should be in a federal system. That is subject matter jurisdiction. If the subject matter itself is criminal, civil, family, probate, etc., it has to be in the correct court. When they talk about waiver, what they're saying is essentially um, a person or a party to the case can sometimes say, well, I waive the lack of subject matter jurisdiction in this court if they want to allow that particular court to hear the case. So that can be done, however, it's very rare. In addition to subject matter jurisdiction, a court must have personal jurisdiction. Personal jurisdiction, on the other hand, refers to whether a court has the power over the persons being sued and can be difficult to determine. That's true. The basic concept behind determining personal jurisdiction is evaluating whether courts in that state have a vested interest in you and a right to make binding decisions over you. These are four of the principles that are used in personal jurisdiction in order to determine. Um, presence. Is the person physically present in the court? Have they been notified? Notice is a big deal in personal jurisdiction. You often hear service of process. Has the person, so for instance, in a criminal case, you have to get a summons issued to you or you have to be arrested on a warrant and then given the documentation. Okay, so in a civil case, again, service of process, you have to be served with the action starting the lawsuit, okay? Also, another principle is domicile or place of business. Is your place of business or where you live physically within the territorial limits of the court? That's why I refer to personal and territorial as sort of one and the same. Um, then we have down here consent. Um, if a person consents to a different court hearing the case, then that court can hear that case. Uh, for instance, there's territorial jurisdiction in regards to counties. If you are in County A, okay, and a case is being brought in County B, and County B doesn't have the necessary territorial or personal jurisdiction because your place of business is not in that county, you can, you can consent to that county hearing the case. Finally, we have the concept of minimum contacts, which is a very important concept. What, what that means is, for instance, when it comes to business or individuals, if they have uh, a lot of contacts in a certain jurisdiction, that court can take territorial or personal jurisdiction over that person. So I'll give an example from a business, right? Amazon, their headquarters are, are located in Seattle. However, they do business in all 50 states. Therefore, any court in any of the 50 states would have personal or ter territorial jurisdiction over Amazon. Um, 
I'm sorry. I, and I said before that, that, that they talked about waiver subject matter jurisdiction. Um, that is actually, it cannot be waived. I said that it could be waived. It cannot be waived. So you have to be in the right court for a case, whether it be family, criminal, or civil. All right. However, this personal or territorial type of jurisdiction can, in fact, be waived. When it comes to sovereign citizens, they have no concept of jurisdiction as I just explained it. Courts are not willy-nilly with jurisdiction. If a legitimate challenge of, in regards to subject matter jurisdiction, personal jurisdiction, or territorial jurisdiction is brought up properly, they will hear it and they will make a decision on the case. You can have cases moved out of certain jurisdictions on that basis. What sovereign citizens are referring to in their loony world is usually they're arguing they have the theory of 14th Amendment citizenship. So they argue that the 14th Amendment, which was passed after the Civil War, created two classes of citizens. One class that are called 14th Amendment citizens who have consented to or have not declared their sovereignty. Therefore, they are subject to the laws of the, of the federal government. Then they have non-14th Amendment citizens. These are sovereign citizens who have declared their sovereignty. Therefore, they believe they are no longer under the authority, yoke, or jurisdiction of the federal or state governments. They see these governments as illegitimate. That's the jurisdiction they are arguing. There's also the sovereign citizen theory that when the United States moved off the gold standard, that the federal and state governments were overtaken by sort of this cabal of shady bankers and corporations. Thus, they refer to the, the federal government as a corporation and even the states as corporations. Therefore, they have declared their sovereignty. They are not subject to the jurisdiction of this illegitimate government. They believe they're subject only to the common law. So that's where they're coming from. They have no concept of the jurisdiction that I just explained, which is the actual law when it comes to jurisdiction. So next, our sovereign citizen challenged the right to a jury trial. Now, it is true that a jury trial is guaranteed under the exact language of the Sixth Amendment. So let's take a look at the law in regards to the right to a jury trial. So we will take a look here at the exact language of the Sixth Amendment. In all criminal prosecutions, the accused shall enjoy the right to a speedy and public trial by an impartial jury of the state and district wherein the crime shall have been committed. Uh, you can read the rest of that if you like. You can see I highlighted there the portion where it says by an impartial jury. This is the portion that sovereign citizens hang on to. Now, the language on its face does make you believe that you should have a impartial jury in each and every criminal case. I concede that to the sovereign citizens. However, the Supreme Court has interpreted the case law differently, has interpreted the Constitution differently. So the Supreme Court case law says serious offenses only. According to the Supreme Court, the jury trial right applies only when serious offenses are at hand. Petty offenses don't invoke it. For purposes of this right, a serious offense is one that carries a potential sentence of more than six months. This is from Baldwin versus New York, a 1970 Supreme Court case. If the penalty is six months or less, the crime is serious only if the sum of its penalties are weighty enough. The Supreme Court decided in one case that up to six months incarceration or five years probation plus a $5,000 maximum fine weren't enough to make a certain kind of DUI a serious offense. So this is the law in regards to the right to a jury trial, the constitutional law.
again, I concede to the sovereign citizens that the plain language of the Constitution seems to infer that a jury trial is a right in every single circumstance. Now, what I didn't go into in this case, but which is in much of the case law, is the historical analysis that the Supreme Court does and has done. What do I mean by historical analysis? Well, when the, a court is interpreting a case, they can look at the facts and circumstances that occurred around the time when that law was written. They'll actually look at the individuals who wrote the law, what their opinions were. In addition to that, they'll look at the discussion that surrounded the law, say in a congressional chamber or in the Senate. When it comes to constitutional analysis. We look at the writings, the Federalist Papers, the customs, mores, and conventions around the time. So what does that history say? What it says is prior to the Constitution being drafted in English law and in colonial United States law, jury trials were not granted to petty offenses. So then the founders write the Constitution as I just read it. Even around the time, contemporaneous with the Constitution, jury trials were not guaranteed for petty offenses. And then after the Constitution was put in place in the late 18th century, throughout the 1800s, up until modern times, courts have not guaranteed a right to a jury trial for petty offenses. This distinction between serious and petty existed before the Constitution, during the time of the Constitution, and in all times since the Constitution. So the Supreme Court has concluded that the founders did not intend for the right to a jury to be absolute for every single offense. They didn't even practice it themselves. If this were the case, then you would get a jury trial for a traffic ticket, for a disorderly conduct. So the courts had to draw a line somewhere. This isn't a new line though. This line existed before the Constitution, during the time of the Constitution, and after the Constitution. Therefore, the Supreme Court felt comfortable outlining the law as it is and as it stands. If your case doesn't carry up to six month, over six months in jail, then you don't get a jury trial. This is a common trap sovereign citizens use because they can argue the plain language of the Constitution. And it does sound very convincing. Most judges probably don't know the historical analysis like I just told you. If I was a judge, I'd blast the sovereign citizen with that and see what they have to say. But this is, this is a good gimmick for the sovereign citizens to use. It's wrong. All judges know the six-month limitation. They don't necessarily know why, why I just you know, how I just explained it to you. So next, we're going to take a look at um, the mens rea and intent element. Now, this isn't a common tool of sovereign citizens, but it was brought up in this interaction, so I'm going to explain it to you. Here is the law for mens rea. Mens rea is Latin for guilty mind. It is the mental element of a person's intention to commit a crime or knowledge that one's action or lack of action would cause a crime to be committed. It is a necessary element of many crimes. The standard common law test of criminal liability is expressed in the following phrase. The act is not culpable unless the mind is guilty. In jurisdictions with due process, and this would apply to the majority of American jurisdictions, there must be mo both actus reus, the guilty act, and mens rea for a defendant to be guilty of a crime. As a general rule, someone who acted without mental fault is not liable in criminal law. Exceptions are known as strict liability crimes, and in our video, uh, the judge stated that the sovereign citizen's crime was of strict liability. So let's look at strict liability as opposed to mens rea. In criminal law, strict liability is liability for which mens rea does not have to be proven in relation to one or more elements comprising the actus reus, although intention, recklessness, or knowledge may be required in relation to other elements of the offense. And just a little clarification there. 
So mens rea is the, the mental or intent element. And that can sometimes be uh, as strict as malice of forethought, such as first degree homicide, where someone had to be actively planning the crime in their mind. And it can be as loose as recklessness or negligence, where the person didn't know that the result would actually occur, but they acted in such a careless way that they should have known. So even the mens rea can be broken down into categories. Regardless, the liability is said to be strict when defendants could, because defendants could be convicted even though they were genuinely ignorant of one or more factors that made their acts or omissions criminal. The defendants may, may therefore not be culpable in any real way. There is not even criminal negligence the least blameworthy level of mens rea. And this, this will be clarified here through these examples of strict liability. A serious offense in which strict liability tends to show up is drunk driving laws. The punishment tends to be on a strict liability basis with no mens rea requirement at all. And I can speak from personal experience, this is true. If you were driving and you were drunk and you had a BAC above the legal limit, it doesn't matter if you knew that you were drunk driving or not, okay? As long as you were driving and as long as the police and the law enforcement can show that you were driving and that your BAC was above a certain limit, you will be found guilty. Your state of mind is irrelevant. That's why it's a strict liability law. Here's another one. In many states, statutory rape is considered a strict liability offense. In these states, 22 as of 2007, this is old. I bet this exists in all states now, but maybe not. It is possible to face felony charges despite not knowing the age of the other person or even if the minor presented identification showing an age of 18 or higher. So what this means is if uh, for statutory rape, which is generally sex with a minor, if the, the defendant was 21 years old and had sex with a female um, who was, let's say, 15 years old, and he did not know her age at all, it does not matter. As long as he was 21 and she was 15, that's all the Commonwealth has to show. All they have to show is that they had sex and that those were the ages. That's strict liability. The defendant's state of mind, whether he knew her age or not, is irrelevant to the crime. These types of crimes are easier to prove generally than ones in which the Commonwealth or the prosecution must show a mens rea. So mens rea is not something that the sovereign citizens generally argue, but it was brought up in this case, so I wanted to explain it to you for your information and knowledge. Usually when it comes to uh, specific aspects of criminal cases, the sovereign citizens argue that they cannot be convicted of victimless crimes, crimes such as driving without a license or possessing drugs. However, that is also not true. All types of laws that are written are, in a way, victimless. However, they brought up mens rea in this case, so I wanted to explain it to you. I hope that you found it interesting. Please, in the comments below, let me know uh, what you thought about this new format. This is something that I may develop more. I may get better at it. I want to know if you like it, and I will do more videos like this and perhaps build on it. it. Makes the videos a little bit longer, but perhaps more interesting and more informative. Uh, it's always a bit entertaining to see see the sovereign citizens go into court, deal with the non no-nonsense judge, and then be dragged off to jail. Uh, he brought up several elements that we talked about today. Uh, we found out the actual law when it comes to jurisdiction, the actual law when it comes to the right to a jury trial, you must be facing six months or more, and the actual law when it comes to mens rea. All of my sources for what I quoted are below in the description. I hope that you enjoyed this episode, found it entertaining and informative. I'm Joe Pometto, Joe the Lawyer. If you like my content, please like, subscribe, comment, and share. Really looking to get subscriptions. Also sign up for my email list. You get a free PDF on the history and examination of the sovereign citizen movement. Thank you for your time. Joe Pometto out.